and good afternoon. Today is Thursday, March 25th. And I want to say thank you so much for rolling on the road with Dr. Kimberly and Dave. Dave is on another assignment on today. And in his stead, we have Maddie. We thank Maddie for being here today on last week. Same day, same time. Mm -hmm. She was in for my stead. So we, we thank you um, from Disability Advocates of Kent County. We want to say thank you so much to the Deaf and Hard of Hearing for rolling with us for, oh my goodness, how long has it been now, Beth? About 10, 11 months now. Yes. We started six weeks after the pandemic the first day of shutdown. So yeah, we started six weeks in. It's been a long haul. Yes, we are COVID long haulers, but in a good way. And um, I want to say thank you to Disability Advocates of Kent County and to 100 Shades of Disability. They sponsor us and they let us do what it is that we do best. And that's informing you, our public audience across the United States. Yes, we are out of Michigan, guys. We really, really are. I think that uh, the rest of the United States are beating our Michiganders. So come on, guys. You need to come on in. We can't let outsiders beat you guys watching us. Today, I am so excited. Yes. <laughs> we have Dr. Temple. So guess what? Ready? Here you Temple. <laughs> And guess Her what? She, she, is, she is not a. We know what this is, right? She's not, not, a, not a zombie. She's not a zombie. <laughs> she's real. She's really that pretty and she's intelligent. And I'm so excited to have her on today. Hey, Dr. Temple, how are you? Hi, Dr. Kimberly Barrington. It is a treat to be with you today and all of those who tune in to watch you. How excited. Mm. We're going to talk about whew, the educational inequities that exist, and they have truly been exacerbated due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, you know what? She's the expert. So, I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry. I got excited because I think my closed captioner just popped up. <laughs> yeah, my little cheat sheet down there. Anyway, so, Dr. Temple, without further ado, it's, you know, it's 401 and um, I really want to get the most out of our time together. So please just tell us a little bit about what it is that you do. Um, yes, I know what you do, but they don't know what you do. Oh, hi everybody. I am uh, from the professoriate world by training. I was trained as a medical sociologist at Michigan State um, and so I've spent the majority of my academic training looking at group inequities that pertain to education and young adult transition, which includes a sprinkle of depression, at least um, epidemi epidemiologically speaking. And here lately, most of my research and publications and agenda focus on inequities and in collegiate transition. So elevator version is, I study poor communities, the children's there, and the hardship associated with getting to school, staying there, and graduating. And we can contextualize this in the current climate that we're in and look above it and see how many nuanced or new hardships might exist in a pandemic world where freshmen weren't actually uh, going to college, they were staying home, or the transition was different, or seniors weren't having um, graduations or maybe the counselor student ratio was even more exacerbated. So these are just some of the more pandemic focused stressors that exist in the lane that I study young adults going to college in. So um, that's an elevator version and I'll stop there and so I, that we can I, entertain questions and talk. But you know what I know what's so interesting is that we talk about these groups, the one group that always gets left out are those young people who want to go to college who have a disability. What do they do? Mm -hmm. You know, and I have really seen that disparity. <laughs> and, you know, we look at it for me and my job in a broad spectrum, but I have really had to 
do a micro view of it. Uh, wow. With our computer program that we have, we give away iPads and to see a micro view of it, it was extremely disparaging to me. And I realized that there are many groups around the United States who were trying to address this issue, but do you in your line of work have, as you say, an elevator version or maybe a three by five card of the top five things that we could really give to our viewers to review? To review in terms of hardships or maybe more specific implications of COVID's impact for the younger I'm, population? I'm thinking, I'm a parent. I have an 11th grader who is going to be a senior and we need to figure out what is our plan gonna be. Number one, we already had some educational disparity because I have, let's say it's an African-American son, his grade point average is maybe 2.8, but his school likes him because he plays sports. But he's only reading at a ninth grade level. And now we have COVID and I'm sitting here and I'm looking who is going to help my son. I think the conversation should really address learning loss. Mm -hmm. So when you think about being an 11th grader last year at the height of a pandemic and transitioning to it, what we really saw was the disruption of standardized instruction where you can get extra help. Instructions taking place in real time. Mm -hmm. are benefited and advantaged by the questions and interactions of your peers. Uh, tutoring services are afforded by the school. All of those auxiliary services that can help you, well, you lost those in addition to real-time instruction. So the conversation really has to occur at the macro level. We can't hear a structural problem and make it an independent interpersonal issue. That's a structural problem. So the question would really be, what do educators, what do decision makers, policy influencers mm -hmm. plan to do to levy the field around the loss of learning that occurred across the student populations? The thing about COVID is that it was universal in its destruction. If you were disadvantaged, it made it worse. You slid down a razor blade and landed in a pool of alcohol. <laughs> oh, it worsened it, it just worsened it. If you were advantaged, it offered you the ability to think about what kind of options do you want to re do you want to access based on the kind of resources you have. So let's be clear. The long-term damage won't impact everyone the same, although the pandemic impacted everyone the same. Absolutely, absolutely. There and are some advantaged communities that were able to do different things, um, bolster up Wi-Fi, hire, hire private tutors, create a home association of neighbors and uh, friends to really yeah. traverse this issue well in poor communities. They were behind the starting line. They had to get Wi-Fi. Or Dr. Barrington, as you know, because of your program, they had to obtain a device. Yes. And I think that's the piece right there that um, has been the most difficult for me when I know that I have an opportunity to help write policy, change procedures. And uh, in fact, I just received you know, an IEP that I have to review that it needs to be turned back into the state by the 29th to say, okay, do you agree with these I, you know, IPEs, which includes education and matriculating into the workforce based on the education that they have received? And as I look at it, I'm just like, you want me to just blanket approve this, you know, and they're looking for the, the quick turnaround. And yet I'm having a con this conversation with you. I'm looking at a stack this high of requests 
that say we don't even have Wi-Fi, we don't even have the computers to even get to the point to even say that, oh, I'm, I'm disadvantaged. I mean, we're, we're not even, there's no, I can't even say the, the, the disc, there's just, I'm starting at ground zero. We have been completely yeah. annihilated, you know, by the pandemic. We were, we were hanging on by a thread. Pandemic came, the thread got cut, and we're just in this cesspool of improprieties. <laughs> we're just stuck in this cesspool. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm looking now, I have this, this document in front of me, have an opportunity to change a policy, a procedure that's gonna affect a whole state. And I'm like, but we have so many other things that, that need to precipitate this document right here. Because guess what, as you stated, those who already had some advantages are really going to benefit from that. And if I was already at a disadvantage, I'm hit. Maddie. Yes. Your thoughts. She's sitting here like, whoa. I am, I am absorbing so much right now. Um, I just, the comments regarding learning loss that Dr. Temple made and thinking about not just across um, economic backgrounds, but also thinking about people who learn differently and different um, types of disabilities, thinking about those who are in um, classrooms for severely and multiply impaired, who have uh, disabilities on the severe end of the spectrum, who their education was focused a lot on social skills and life skills and things like that, and how getting individuals to focus in front of a screen if they aren't able to for long periods of time, kind of how that may have affected those people differently or those individuals differently when you have different learning needs. And so just um, thinking about how that kind of plays out in, in the long run. Um, I think, so the, like this question, you know, there, there's, a, there's this question that people ask, how can we help uh, navigate the impact of COVID-19, especially in educational spaces for young adults. That question, if you're going to attempt to answer it thoughtfully, well, in a way where the results can actually be implemented from this kind of discussion and thinking, I think you have to think about impact along a social emotive continuum and then the outcomes of something like education and standardized matriculation. So there was this great article. I did a really good job. And I'm a fan these days of anything I can read in three minutes. They're doing this new thing where they're putting how long it takes you to read an article. I don't know who thought of this, but I put them right well, you up know there. What? Person well, I, I'm going to tell you, part of that came out of accessibility. So if you have cognitive learning um, disability, that was one of the things that was implemented. Tell me how long it's going to take for me to be able to get through this material so that I can gauge, you know, if I need to employ some other way for understanding or for reading. So yeah, that, that is definitely a disability accessibility plus. Well. What a and wonderful it, advantage it is provided for everybody. It's, it's and fantastic. This is what, and, and this is what I do for a living is to tell people it's not just okay for the disability community, but when you make things accessible for one group, you've made accessibility for all. You know, you've made accessibility for many because for varying reasons, I mean, you're extremely busy. And ima imagine if you didn't know how long it was going to take, you know, you can. So, hmm. Dr. Temple is a planner, a list maker, a note taker. <laughs> and it's like, if I have 15 things to do and I have exactly two hours and 15 minutes, you know, so her knowing how much time it's gonna take for her to read this article, she can plan and say, well, I can read exactly four articles, have them all out of the way within the first 32 minutes of my two hours and 15 minutes. So yeah. I, mm. <laughs> Where I was going with that is that Psychology Today put out an article that I thought had sociological, great sociological implications. It was called Five Types of Loneliness During the Pandemic. 
And I began to read this and think about the types and groups, the archetypes of whole groups I can put under certain things. But one thing that this article did extremely well as it traversed the difference between loneliness and isolation. No one is exempt from isolation right now. Isolation is measured in terms of how much contact you have. Uh -huh. An executive order at the height of COVID really limited that. And we're still not fully to the state of restoration where you can control that the way that you like. Uh -huh. So isolation is measured in terms of how much contact you have. Loneliness is actually the consequence of having fewer or compromised relationships than you'd want. So if you think about something like a pandemic and you put it in the context of young adults who are just developing relationships, Mm -hmm. or navigating what it means to um, interact with people or enjoy that. Uh, isolation differentially in impacted people who didn't have those relationships fully intact yet. So it is the combination of those things. There's isolation, there's loneliness, and then we can stratify that by age. Some of us who are um, experiencing navigating that maybe a tiny bit more successfully. Maybe you have the privilege of having relationships in your life that are 20 years old. Well, if I'm not even 20, my yeah. relationships aren't formed and fashioned that way yet. So it's a real loss for me to not be at school. It produces real anxiety for me not to be playing soccer this time. It's really, really making me nervous that I'm not able to read people's lips because they're wearing a mask and I'm a student with a disability. Or, I, you know, visually I'm compromised by excessive screen time and there is no resource center for persons with disabilities in my home that was in the school. So all of those things create heightened sensitivities to both isolation and loneliness. And I was thinking about this because um, before this, did you know that um, three in 10 of millennials reported being constantly lonely? This was before the pandemic, three in 10. And now we're seeing those numbers increase. And when you think about it, one in five, I think Americans reported feeling uh, lonely and socially isolated often, one in five. So we're talking about more extreme cases here. But one of the things that I think is noticeable or uh, notable is that when we think about loneliness and think about isolation and the chronicity of groups that experience these kinds of things, they're exacerbated by things like finance, employment, and housing. So for people who feel uh, lonely, the one in five adults that reported, I feel lonely a lot. Well, that same group and truncation of adults also are correlated with groups that have you know, um, issues in finance, issues in housing, and issues in employment. And I bring this up because the pandemic affected all three of those areas. Right. It infected housing security, mm -hmm. it infected employment and the types of work that's going to be essential or not, sustained or not, compromised or not, shut down longer or not. And uh, personal finances, your, if your, your job is in jeopardy, well, so is your wallet. And if your wallet and your job are in jeopardy, it won't be long before your house is. So we see that the pandemic has created upsets in these areas that affect units of people like families, families that contain kids, kids that are experiencing uh, the loss, impact and stress of these things at that level. So I've been thinking a lot about this. There isn't a simple answer. I think, you know, no. I can sit before you as an oracle and say, Behold, I have the answer. Um, yes. I have an analysis, a way that we can begin to think about this, consider it, and maybe thoughtfully begin change that is equitable. Yes. We are now at the 418 hour. Um, thank you so much, Temp uh, Dr. Temple, 
we, we know each other in more than one, <laughs> one area. So I want to say today is Thursday, March 25th, and today our guest is Dr. Temple. And um, we want to say thank you so much to the Deaf and Hard of Hearing for being with us for the last 11 months. Thank you so much to Disability Advocates of Kent County and to 100 Shades of Disability who are our sponsors and they allow us to do the things that we do. Bring you some great news information that can help you in real time. Today we are talking about the educational disparities that existed prior to the pandemic and now have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think we all are kind of frustrated because where do we begin when the genesis was not in the pandemic, but prior to had not been addressed. And once the pandemic came, it exacerbated. And I think as we have said this entire 11 months is that the pandemic has ripped a bandaid off of the apathy that we all were experiencing prior to uh, the pandemic. And it really revealed who and what we were as a people, as a culture, and it shined the light on our deficits. And so, you know, I, I believe that it truly has leveled the playing ground. It gives us an opportunity to, you know, when children play with Legos, they don't like the way something goes, they get mad, they stomp on it and they rip them all apart. And then they begin to rebuild again. And sometimes they may <clears throat> look at the instructions other times they may look at what they did wrong the first time that didn't make it work. And they said, you know what, how about I should make, come up with a strategy to make this be built just a little bit differently. And today we are talking about, we need to build some things a little bit differently and maybe come up with some strategies. One thing I am excited about that it is almost the end of Women's History Month. I'm not excited about that, but the fact that there are all women on the show today and um, it, it's awesome. And we are definitely putting our minds together to see how we can in our sphere of influence, think about how we can make some changes. So Maddie, after whew, we just heard what we heard, what are your thoughts about that? There's, that was, that was a lot to take in Dr. Temple, but I really loved all the, that information. Um, I think everyone can relate to the concept of isolation versus loneliness. And I think when you kind of mentioned the statistic of like, what was it? The millennials, how many of them felt some sense of loneliness? Um, mm -hmm. And what kind of popped into my head was how much we're relying on screen time and like pre-pandemic we were very much like don't be on the screen so much like go out and play or meet with your friends or hang out see them um but then when you are feeling that lonely feeling like you end up scrolling on Facebook or social media to see what everyone else is up to but then that kind of almost also makes it worse but now Zoom and Facebook and social media is like one of the only ways to connect with people right now. Um, but does that really kind of help with the sense of loneliness or isolation? Like, do we think that, I don't know, are you able to make those same connections, but then also those who are without the ability to be regularly on the internet, uh, how has the loneliness and isolation continued to go for those individuals who aren't able to get on their screens regularly or if they don't have a screen to get on? Like, um, I think that touch is important. I think people find a way to fill those needs in those pockets by the screen time and they would do that with their telephones. Mm -hmm. So I think that piece kind of speaks for itself because it was already happening. Uh, but I think we always like options because mm -hmm. I do this because I want to, but I know I have the option if I want to get in my car or get on the bus, get on my mm -hmm. bike, then I can go over to John's house and go hang out or we can just kick around some balls or go play basketball. Mm -hmm. And when that was taken away, 
-hmm. it was like, oh, wait a minute. It, it gave us a different perspective because we always had a choice and now the choice has been taken away. And I think that's what um, is making the difference. But I do want to say that the premise of this show was because I saw an article, I think we were only about five weeks into the pandemic and I was perusing the internet and saw this article that was in Forbes. And it said that mm -hmm. ooh, the pandemic has now created the perfect disability, you know, social model that this is how we live on a regular basis. And now everybody else has just now come into our world. And I believe that, you know, Dr. Temple touched on that, gave us some really great numbers because the numbers that she used for feeling isolated and feeling lonely are the same numbers that we have for the number of persons who will have a disability in their lifetime. And what we're finding now, we have a whole new group of people who have been added. I think we're at, with the long haulers, we're at about... 70,000 new people who now are a part of the disability community and counting. So those are those who are considered long haulers. We're not even talking about the people who are on the periphery who are experiencing some disabilities that they didn't experience before because of the isolation and the loneliness. So now we have a, we're creating another pocket of people who will now be on the list of the dis. And when I say the dis list, it's the disadvantaged, the disenfranchised, um, the disabled, and the list goes on. We can put dis in front of any particular word that we want to because of what it, the prefix means. Dis, the ability not to do, to be, to have as you normally would. Dr. Temple? You know, I think, I think I like thinking in terms of the impact to all, because it's not something we really do well in westernized cultures. We We're not, not really collectivists. Uh, and in a tactful and diplomatic way, I'm avoiding saying it another way that could also be understood well. Uh, we're selfishly motivated, especially in areas of privilege, advantage, comfort, uh, we're slow to relinquish those things for the inclusion, benefit, comfortability of everyone. Most of everyone, some of everyone is good for extremely advantaged um, populations. And I think the pandemic has given us a social mirror to look through and really examine that reflection carefully. Um, one of the things that I think is so key about a pandemic especially if you think about its consequences, is that it forces universal thinking and population totalistic examination. You can no longer just think about you, the, the me, the I. We are a part of a us. Everyone is experiencing a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Oprah, our neighbor, those who take shelter publicly, all of those populations are impacted. And what I, what I was really jolted by are the things that have impacted us all. Here's just a couple of things that I think most of us can relate to across broad spectrums of diversity. When we say something like, oh, um, mental health is being impacted by COVID, Exactly what though? Are we talking about the disorders? Are we talking about anxiety? What are we talking about? How specific have we uh, been afforded the opportunity to unpack that? And so- uh, I believe that is too. It is depression and anxiety. And we have had the conversation here on the show. We had five areas that were addressed and social agencies that were included. We had Network 180 that deals with the emergent um, mental breakdown from those who have either depression and or anxiety or suffer from being bipolar or if they're having a schizophrenic break and or those who are suffering from PTSD. And then we had 
those caregivers, you know, that take care of people that had already had mental illnesses. And then we have providers that said their clients uh, base roles and they had a number of new clients because people said, you know, I've never had experienced depression before, but somewhere, you know, I'm feeling depressed. And it was maybe about 90 days in. And some of the things that were talked about was you know, not having the social interaction of going to work, having to be at home and actually divide their time up, you know, from one room with their family and uh, not being able to separate work and home caused them great depression and anxiety. I want to read some things really quickly and maybe we can talk about them. Um, they're just very short statistics around metrics or areas that we're all familiar with. And maybe you've heard some of these, but I think it would advantage us in thinking about when we say the impact of this, especially if we're thinking about, um, it's, it's so hard to think about like education because it's being disrupted and it's being disrupted because of a, a number of things. But, but listen to this. When we think about mental health and well-being, and we think about specific negative impacts, and we look at it across sleeping, eating, or maladaptive coping, like increases in alcohol, or you know the ability to not exercise, the kind of movement fluidity disruptions and sedentary lifestyle. Uh, listen to some of these things. There's been an increase among adults and young adults. So this is all population. We could just say the population in experiencing difficulty in sleeping. 36% of adults have reported increases in difficulty sleeping. Eating more or less, 32%. Increases in alcohol consumption. So we don't think about staying at home and working. And I think it creates levels of innovation. I think it creates necessary coping. I think it creates um, con 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 continuance and work, but it also creates access too, to other things. If increased screen time and fatigue have also been associated with increases in alcohol consumption. Um, and substance abuse, which is up 12%, and worsening chronic conditions. So for people who were already managing chronic pain, chronic conditions, it's increased by 12%. And so when you hear these things, we have to hear this as these numbers are reflective and attached to entire populations of people. And so if you're thinking about education or if you're thinking about disability, all of these things are attached to it. So they're inextricably linked. You can't just talk about, I wanna improve education. I wanna, well, that is also inextricably connected to all those other things. Uh, you no longer get the convenience of stratifying the conversation to something that we can, we can remedy fast and tangibly. It's forcing you to look at things systematically and things that have been systemic. So I think that's what um, I would really push. And especially in areas that are uh, provocative or wrought with some kind of disagreement. The thing about where we live and the ultimate types of freedom that we've experienced is that when we can't agree about matters of ultimate value, we will resort to procedural consent. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I don't know what to do about the digital divide, and that's that, and that's those people, but go ahead and just approve the stimulus then. Have you really tackled the in inequality that created the necessity for a stimulus? Absolutely not, absolutely yeah. not. And, and I think that we have a habit of just throwing something at a problem instead of dealing with it. And that's what the pandemic has done. It has ripped that Band-Aid off. I can't just throw um, a dollar at it. I can't just throw, oh, I came up with this wonderful plan. It sounded good. 
we'll just throw that out to the people and they'll hold on to it while I go do something else because I'm not going to upset you know, my wonderful life. But we've got a few uh, comments here. So for Tanji, she is all the way in Detroit. She says, good afternoon. Jerry, yeah. Judy Markle says, this is a good talk. Jerry Stevens says, hello. Um, Brian says, oh yeah, that this conversation is greatly needed. Joshua said that we've been making some great points. And the comment is, thank you so much for these conversations. Um, oh, and there is an agreement. The pandemic is bringing others into our world. Shana says, hello. Shana is all the way in Bell Elk. Air Maryland and I want to say thank you to her my earrings today are courtesy of Shana so oh, please find her on social media it is get crocheted by Shana these don't have crochet in them today they do have the pretty beads that pick up the colors you know in my dress so I want to say thank you so much so my earrings are courtesy of get crocheted by Shana and um, we're just so excited about the conversation that we're having today I think as always, when you have a good conversation, we think that we're answering one question and then it begins to pose other questions and expose other issues that have not been dealt with. But we are now at the 435 hour. We wanna say thank you so much for tuning in. This is Rolling on the Road with Dr. Kimberly and Dave. Dave is on assignment today and Maddie is in his stead. So we are thankful for Maddie. She is, um, Transition? Independent living. Independent living. So she's an independent living specialist with disability advocates of Kent County. I, you know what? Forgive me. Forgive me. You know I'm handicapped. So I, I'm going to use that as an excuse today. Yes. I'm trying to remember all of these things in my little pretty peanut head. Yes. And we want to say thank you so much to Beth, who's with the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, who's been rolling with us for the last 11 months. And our guest today is Dr. Temple. And um, she has definitely given us a lot of information to process on today. And I would challenge anyone who can write policy procedures um, as part of the system, has some influence to really let's stop and take a look that the analogy that I used is that we're, we're little kids with Legos. We have just crushed our project because we don't like it. All the pieces are lying on the floor and we're getting ready to put these pieces back together. And maybe the first time we did it, we had yellow, blue, green, and a little bit of orange and it didn't quite look right. But now we have an opportunity to put the blue with the blue, the yellow with the yellow, and see if we can get a better fit, make it look aesthetically pleasing, and um, maybe be a little bit more functional than what it has been. And um, I think we all have the power to do something within our sphere of influence. And right now, I think I'm, I'm feeling in a very sober place, a very sober emotionally and you know me I will cry <laughs> the ugly cry on here and to hear the numbers to listen to Dr. Temple it makes me want to cry yeah I gotta get some tissue it, it, it does it, it makes me want to cry Um, because she spoke a truth and um, she spoke something very honest out of her profession and she used facts to back it up and that is we're probably no better off now than we were prior to the pandemic and that we actually will be even more disenfranchised. And everyone wants to say, I wanna get back to normal. She just read to you 
what our normal has been. This is a pandemic normal. This is pre-pandemic normal is what she read to us. And this is what people want to go back to? Really? This is what you want to go back to? She exposed us. <laughs> You've exposed us, Dr. Temple. Well, I mean, I think it's important for us to think and ask a, um, you know, here is a uh, maybe optimistic pendulum shift to a very sobering and necessarily sobering place to be in. Uh, we're, we're all there sharing that space with you, uh, Dr. Kemp. The thing that we need to acknowledge openly is that we have varying levels of privilege. We do. We all do. You have some level of, of operative privilege in your life. And I think one centering question that we're not normally asking, we're normally centering on who has the privilege and advantage and who doesn't. And that's a good question. It creates awareness. And if you can understand something, you can address something. But something we're often not asking is what do you want to do with it? I think this is a time to really think about the stewardship of power and privilege that occurs at varying levels, micro, meso, and macro. Mm -hmm. At the interpersonal level, how will you better steward kindness because you are aware that anxiety or isolation and loneliness is on the rise? What do you want to do to exercise that level of privilege that you have at the micro level? Does it show up as increased compassion, understanding, listening longer, talking less, lowering your voice? What does that look like for you at that level? At the mezzo level, if you think about your family or coworkers or neighbors or communities or those places in the middle, where can you use your influence, your network, your resources, your voice? to influence those things. At the macro level, what do all these things mean for policy? Things that we'll pay attention to, things that we'll note. The pandemic was devastating, but it was also a gift of macro awareness. <laughs> it elucidated on grand stage some of the issues that we have. Issues around compliance, <laughs> issues around um, um, compassion, um, issues around unifying. We have been afforded a tremendous gift and sight. We can see things very clearly now. Uh, and so it offers us the advantage of being able to fix things differently. I just want to say this and then I will stop and I can say it very quickly. Years ago, I had a friend who had gotten into a very tragic rollover car accident. It was really tragic. The car was totaled. It was a scary incident. And those who watched it said that they were certain that my friend had not survived. Well, not only did he survive, he survived without injury or upset to his person. And he told me that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I said, oh my God, how is that? And he said, because I remembered what I was thinking when that car was reeling out of control and was not distinguishing me from any other object in the car. I remembered what was important what I wanted to change, what I wanted to address, and I survived with the ability to pursue it. That car accident gave me the most clarity and direction of my life. It was the best thing that happened to me. Well, America is in a similar position. We've survived the rollover car accident of the pandemic, and some of us are alive to figure out what we'd like to do with the clarity we've been afforded. We have a very clear path forward on some level, but we've been afforded the opportunity to address what we saw. We can't unsee it. We saw it and we are in a position to address it. I wanna say thank you 
<laughs> thank it's you. It's a privilege thank to be thank with you. you. Um, to Dr. Temple. Thank you so much to you, Maddie, for filling in for uh, Pastor Dave today. Yes. Of course. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. And um, Dr. Temple, that was a great segue to take us into our epilogue. And we want to say thank you. We want My to say pleasure thank you. and privilege. My, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we were given a lot of information on today. And I loved, loved, it wasn't an analogy, it was a metaphor as to what we need to do, the rollover, time, 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 the rollover and um, being thrown around. And now the car has landed on all fours. Sometimes it lands upside down on its head. And, uh, but we've landed right side up on all fours. And I want to know what has this pandemic made you think about that within your sphere of influence, you are going to change. Not thinking about the micro or the meso, but thinking about the macro. Mm -hmm. Thinking about that macro. This is a call to action. It's a call to action. It's a call to action. And it is my hopes and it is my prayer that you internalize this call to action. And as the call goes out, when they say to call your congressman, call your state rep, I ask you to call on your own self and look within you and think on the macro level on how you are going to make a change within your sphere of influence. Thank you for tuning in today. It has been an awesome week. And please go back. If you missed a show this week, um, it, it, was, it was really, really great. Um, on Tuesday, Dave and I, it was Talk About It Tuesday we began the conversation with the impact that the vaccine is now having and how it is continue to create another divide, another separation, another area of loneliness. Um, a policy and a procedure has been put in place now for the haves and the have nots, the haves of the shot and the have nots um, who cannot or maybe will not have it and how that's going to affect you as you want to move through society. And um, then we came back and we talked about how we would use the money when we receive our stimulus check. And today you have been given a call to action. So it has been a full week. I implore you to take the time to go back and um, check out the shows. They are also on YouTube. So like, share, subscribe, and um, get those conversations going. We definitely have left you with enough information that you can have an intellectual conversation with your group on the micro, meso, and macro level. You can use it at your leisure as a way to begin a conversation. So until next week, uh, please do not forget to mask up. That's one way that you can help and solve a problem. We appreciate you and we'll see you on next week.